Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Have you ever been surprised to discover that a plant or an animal that you thought you knew well, like perhaps an oak or a milkweed or bumblebee, actually encompassed a vast array of distinct species? Well, today we're diving into a world that's equally diverse and captivating, and that's the world of viruses. They may not be as readily observable as plants and animals, but they're an essential part of our natural world. Helping us today is Dr. Robert David Siegel, a renowned professor of microbiology and immunology at Stanford University. With his extensive expertise in virology, Dr. Siegel sheds light on how viruses fit into the broader ecological landscape. We'll explore their types, diversity, and the intriguing ways that they infect their hosts and evolve. Have you ever wondered why some viruses have the ability to infect multiple species or make astonishing jumps from one species to another? We'll delve into that topic with a focus on well-known examples like influenza and coronaviruses. And of course, we can't forget our own immune system. It's the incredible shield that protects us from these viral invaders. So Dr. Siegel takes us on a journey through the basics of our immune system, including insights into the innate and adaptive systems. And did you know that the reaction that we get from poison oak and poison ivy is actually an immune response? If you think you are immune to those plants, you might be surprised. We can't conclude our discussion without addressing the promises and myths surrounding mRNA vaccines. They're a vital part of virus control. But that's not all. Dr. Siegel's a nature lover and an accomplished photographer. He shares some of his tales chasing and photographing every order of birds in the world. You'll certainly be inspired by his nature endeavors, and he graciously recounts many of those during the final part of our conversation. So get ready to embark on an enlightening and awe-inspiring journey into the world of viruses, their ecological significance, and the wonders of our immune system. So without further delay, Dr. Robert Siegel. Bob, thank you for joining me today. This has been a long time in the making. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So just for a little context for people listening, Bob and I have met a few times on BioBlitzes here in the Bay Area. Bob, in addition to being an expert in the fields of immunology and virology and associated areas, uh, is a really great naturalist and photographer. And that's how we first met. It's been fun getting to know Bob, and we've had a number of side discussions on these bio blitzes about viruses. And of course, COVID was a big reason for that. But even more generally, talking about viruses in nature and where they fit and adaptations that we as people have had to them and so forth. So I think that it's going to be a lot of fun to look at this topic today with that as our background. Great. So Bob, then can you tell me, how did you initially get interested in nature and then virology more specifically? Great question. So yeah, I always tend to answer things at length and complicated, but I grew up in South Florida. South Florida is an amazing place. But the thing is where you grow up, you don't realize that where you're living is an amazing place because it's just your home. So now when I go back there, it's full of all these weird creatures and plants and all kinds of stuff that from my California eyes look bizarre. And from my Florida growing up eyes, they just look normal. And even things that were introduced, like we have a lot of Madagascar periwinkles growing in people's yards. I just thought periwinkles, that's what grows in Florida. Then, of course, iNatural changes your mind about things like weeds because we had plants that would grow in our yard, which our yards were composed of crabgrass. And we had these little things that would come up and they were weeds. But now I know some of them are really interesting. There's this one, I love the name of it. It's called Turkey Tangle Frog Fruit. And we had it growing all over the place. And if you actually look closely, it's got these really beautiful flowers. I wouldn't say there's any kind of seminal moment. And when I was in the sixth grade, a new school opened. This school was an experimental public high school. And one of the things they did was they allowed you to move ahead in different subjects, particularly science and math. They chose a small number of kids who were good in science and math, selected by their teachers to go over to the high school and start taking basically seventh grade math and science. And so that propelled me in math and science. So that was one critical thing. The one thing I totally regret is that we never, when we went to school, said, okay, we're going to leave the classroom and the world is our classroom. We're going to go outside. We're going to do the stuff that I do in my photography class. We're going to look, we're going to learn, we're going to communicate. We never did that. So we were living in this incredibly interesting place. And basically we sat in an air-conditioned room and studied a textbook. And so I wish they would modify the whole educational system so that people got out more. And in fact, I live very close to the Everglades. And the first time I ever got into sort of Everglades swampy things was I went camping in high school and that like changed my life. 
I was already like graduating from high school by the time I finally went an hour away from home or less into the Everglades. And the Everglades, again, is just world-class ecological site. I realize I've now acquired a lot of affinity for that from growing up in South Florida. But like, imagine living, you know, an hour away from alligators and never having seen them. It's a travesty, but that, that was what everybody did. You did mention that you were a little bit ahead in science because of this opportunity that you had. So when you went to university, did you go straight into medical areas or what was your approach? Did you know that you were going to get into this field at that point? Definitely not. It's, it's funny because as a kid, my parents say, whenever somebody said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say, I want to be a space scientist chemist. I didn't even know what those words were. As an undergraduate, you know, I tried out math because I had been pretty advanced in math. And then I tried out music because I thought maybe that would be a way to go. I ended up majoring in psychology, but I gravitated toward physiological psychology, what might now be called neuroscience. And then my first master's degree was in education. So that foretold the future. And then I spent a year as a professional teaching assistant in this program called human biology at Stanford. And even though I had gotten my degree in social science, I actually was part of the biology part of that core curriculum because I just thought the biology was really cool. During that year, which was in the sort of second half of the 1970s, it was an unbelievable time for science. So science yeah. sometimes has these fits and spurts that it's not always equally productive. And it was a time when DNA sequencing was first developed just before that. The time when recombinant technology was, which I think is probably the most important sort of laboratory advance in biological history, allowing people to move genes around, things like that. So all these things were going on and they were super exciting. And so I decided to get a PhD in molecular biology. Again, not having had had taken a chemistry, physics, a biology core, because I jumped right into advanced biology or math. I took one math class and that was it. Again, somebody saw something in me that was remarkable. So I went to graduate school and got a PhD in molecular biology. And it was such an exciting time. And one of the most exciting things was viruses. So if you're going to sequence different things or you're going to study the biology, it was useful to look at a simple system where you could understand stuff. I got more and more interested in viruses as model systems. Uh, I had the opportunity to teach a course. I taught a class on cancer. And it was estimated that 15 to 40 percent of cancers had at least a viral component to them. So viruses, again, played a role. The first class I actually taught at Stanford was actually a chemistry class. So the chairman of this department asked me to teach a chemistry class. I said, you know, Mert, you know, I've never actually taken chemistry. And he said, yeah, I know, but you got a PhD in molecular biology, so you must know what chemistry you would need to know to, to learn biology. So I thought, yeah, well, that sort of makes sense. Who knows? So the first class I taught at Stanford was actually a chemistry class, having not taken chemistry. And then, and then I proposed a class on viruses and basically I've been teaching that same class ever since called Humans and Viruses. So again, it's, I stumbled into this and it just got more and more interesting. And that's continued to the current time. It's just continuing to get more interesting and new techniques are becoming available that just open up vast new possibilities. So maybe you can start at a super high level and just tell me like, what is a virus and how do you think about a virus? Hey, nature enthusiast, do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website, but this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. Okay, I actually teach a very intensive course. It's 120 hours of lecture over two quarters called Humans and Viruses. And my goal is by the end of the course, they'll know what a virus is. 
So there isn't one single thing that defines what a virus is, but all viruses have certain properties in common. Viruses are smaller than cells. Viruses have genetic information that allows them to make copies of themselves. Viruses all have a two phases of existence. They have an, a phase where they're inside the cell making more virus particles, and then they have a phase where they leave the cell and they actually have to get either to another cell within the body of their host, or they have to get to another host. So those two phases are called the inert and the dynamic phase. And those, some of those things are things that absolutely distinguish them from living things. So there are some equivalents in living things. We have things like spores in different fungi or plants that kind of are inert and they wait for the right conditions, but not, nothing quite equivalent to what we might see with a virus. So there's a series of properties that together are what we consider to be a virus. And then the thing that's interesting is that each viral group, we talk about viral families, has certain properties that distinguish it. One of the things that I spend a lot of time talking about is what are the things that distinguish coronavirus? Because that's on everybody's mind. And just to go at length to your question, for instance, people often will compare coronaviruses to influenza. Now, there is a classification system for viruses, and in that classification system, which is similar to the classification we use for living things, coronaviruses and influenza are in different phyla. So that would be equivalent to comparing humans to sponges. So I bristle a little bit when I hear people making these comparisons without thinking about the unique differences between different groups of viruses. My takeaway from that is that when we think about viruses, it's like thinking about animals or some really high level within our taxonomical tree. Let's run with that here for a moment and pick your virus, influenzas or coronaviruses. If you start to drill down within those realms, what does that look like? So you're asking about what is it that distinguishes different viruses? And I focus primarily on viruses that infect humans, either viruses that use humans as their primary host or viruses that occasionally infect humans. If we think about viruses that infect humans, depending on what your considerations are, about 33 groups or families of viruses. And so if we can ask, what is it that distinguishes one family of viruses from another? At the highest level is something that's absolutely fascinating. So the highest level of distinction between viruses is what is the nature of their genetic material? What is the nature of the thing that actually says how to make a new virus? Now, all living things have DNA as their genetic material. Some viruses have DNA as their genetic material also, but the majority of viruses that infect humans actually have RNA as their genetic material. So that's a fundamental difference, is there are no living things that have RNA as their primary genetic material. Now, all living things actually use RNA in terms of carrying out their metabolism and carrying out their gene expression and things like that. We might actually think about why is it that so many viruses have RNA as their genetic material. And still at that highest level, We can think about one of the fundamental organizing principles of all of biology, and that's called the central dogma of biology. And the central dogma of biology, which was formulated in the 1960s by Francis Crick, when people were first discovering these molecules and figuring out what they did, was that all living things have their genetic information in the form of DNA, and that DNA is actually expressed in the form of RNA, And I'll explain this a little bit more in just a second. And that RNA is used to actually make proteins. And most of the interesting machines and structures in the cell are actually made out of protein. So in a way, it looks like RNA is the intermediary between DNA instructions and the actual materials that we use to make a cell. And in a way, you can think about this as, for instance, if you've got a cookbook and it was full of all kinds of recipes for making different things, the RNA might be the equivalent of making a photocopy of one page. You take it out of the book, you take that photocopy and take it into the kitchen where it might get batter or other things on it. 
but you use those instructions to make the actual pie or whatever it is that you're going to make. So in, in biological systems, RNA typically serves as an intermediary between the primary purveyor of genetic information, DNA, and the protein structures and machines that we see. And in biological systems, DNA can replicate itself, but when you make RNA, it has no way to copy itself. It can only be used basically to make protein. So one fundamental question is, if RNA is a genetic material for the majority of viruses, how can it possibly copy itself? Because it's going to use the cell to do all its processing, and the cell doesn't have a way of copying RNA. So that leads to another interesting sort of aspect of viruses, and that is that all RNA viruses and some DNA viruses actually carry in the instructions for making a machine that allows them to make a copy of their genetic material. So they carry in a unique machine that allows them to make an RNA copy of their RNA, for instance. Now, that would be the case for influenza or polio or Ebola or SARS-CoV-2. There is one group of viruses that actually has a different machine that allows it to make a DNA copy of its RNA. And that will then use the cells machines to take the DNA and make more virus particles. So again, we're, this is very basic stuff, but it, we're already getting into the weeds if you're not familiar with molecular biology and DNA or RNA which as a somebody who has a PhD in molecular biology, this is like my bread and butter and my happy place. I, I do have a suggestion. You said that you teach 120 hour courses that you hope your students come away with understanding what a virus is from that. So what we can do here, this podcast is probably going to be roughly an hour. If you can talk at 120 times speed, yeah. then maybe we'll be good. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it. Being serious for a moment, when you talk about the RNA viruses, bringing their own machinery to replicate themselves. What's that machinery? Interestingly enough, and we're, we'll come back to the whole classification thing because we're just at the highest level of DNA versus RNA, but that machinery is basically a gene, the information for making a, a protein. The protein that they're making is actually a machine that, I, that allows them to copy their genetic material. Okay. And some RNA viruses actually have to bring that machine in. And other RNA viruses actually just bring in the information. And as soon as they get into the cell, the cell says, oh, this is RNA. This is messenger RNA. I know how to turn this into a protein. So they don't even need to bring the machine in. They just bring in the instructions for the machine. And for those viruses, the first thing they have to do is to actually make the protein that allows them to continue the process. So they actually come in as preformed messenger RNA. And other viruses that come in as the template for making messenger RNA, they actually have to bring in their own protein. It's essentially the same protein, but because the cell can't recognize their RNA genome and express it immediately, they have to bring in their protein to create RNA from their genome. Wow. So there's so much diversity here. And I know we've just scratched the surface and it's already apparent how much diversity there is within the world of viruses. And I see two directions I could go right now. We could keep going down this path if you would like and maybe hit the next layer. Okay, so we talked about one of the fundamental things that distinguishes different types of viruses, and that is, is there genetic material? Is the information for making that type of virus DNA or RNA? Then we can go down to the next level. And it turns out at the next level, we can ask, is there genetic message single-stranded DNA or RNA or double-stranded DNA or RNA. Now, typically, DNA is double-stranded. So the, do the DNA in our cells is double-stranded. But some viruses, interestingly enough, bring in a single strand of DNA. The same thing is true for RNA viruses. Most RNA in a cell is single-stranded, but some viruses actually come in with double-stranded RNA as their genome. Okay, so their starting place for these different viruses can be different. And we use that as a second level of classification. Then we also can say, is the RNA that comes in, can, is it preformed message that can be used to make protein? Or is it something that has to be transformed into messenger RNA? And so that's another level of classification for these viruses. So those are just the genetic information for the viruses at the most basic level. Now, if we go beyond that, we can say, what is the structure of the extracellular virus particle? 
So some viruses, as their extracellular particle, have they they all have a protective protein coat. Okay, something that allows them to to avoid destruction in the environment. And that protective protein coat has a terminology. It's called a capsid. All viruses have a capsid. That's one of the. It's in fact, it's the only gene that all viruses have to encode is a capsid protein, because even the machine that allows them to copy their genetic material, sometimes they can use, if they're DNA, they can actually use the cells machine. If we look at that capsid, that protein coat, in some cases, it's like a box. And that box is not box shaped. It's actually a box that has 20 sides. It's an icosahedron. So what they do, those viruses stuff their genetic material into this 20-sided box, and then it protects them when they go outside the cell or outside the body. Other viruses have a box that's basically like a necklace. And so you can think about the string as being the genetic material, and there's beads on the string, and the beads actually protect the genetic materials. So there's a whole group of viruses that have a helix as their protective protein coat. So that's another level. Is that virus either icosahedral, 20-sided? Is it helical or is it neither of those? So there's a few viruses like pox viruses that are neither icosahedral or helical. And there's a few viruses that actually have a double box like retroviruses. So they actually have a helical capsid and then above the helical capsid, they actually have an icosahedral-like capsid. Now, at the next level, we can divide viruses into those that actually have a membrane around the box, a membrane around the capsid, or those that don't. So that membrane is a little covering that's made out of the material from the cell membrane. So what these viruses do is they actually steal cell membrane to wrap the protective box, the capsid. The majority of viruses actually have one of those membranes around the capsid. Viruses that have a membrane are called envelope viruses, and viruses that lack a membrane are called naked viruses. And so that's another high-level classification. So we can first ask, is it DNA or RNA? Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Does it serve as message or does it have to be transformed? What kind of container does it have? What kind of capsid does it have? And does it have an envelope? Does it have a membrane or not? So these are a series of things that allow us to divide viruses into different groups. Does the membrane and the capsid relate to how long a virus can survive in the wild? If you're lacking a membrane, will you have a shorter lifespan? That's an outstanding question. And the answer is, it's actually quite the opposite. The membrane, which is like a soap bubble, can easily dry up. And once it dries up, the virus can't infect anything. So in fact, what tends to happen is that Envelope viruses tend to be less stable in the environment. So if you think about viruses that cause gastroenteritis that are transmitted by somebody coming in contact with feces from somebody that was infected, those viruses tend not to have a membrane. And then and those viruses are all icosahedral. So they have a one of the 20-sided boxes and no envelope, and that allows them to be pretty inert in the environment. So they're much stabler. So we might actually, for each of these things, we might pick a virus like influenza or SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID, and we might say, how does that fit into this picture? And we can go down the classification a little bit further also, but among the things that we talked about, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. It has a, a single strand, okay? It actually can serve as message as soon as it goes in, so it doesn't have to bring in its protein machine because it immediately gets the cell to create that protein machine. It has a helical capsid. All viruses that affect humans that have a helical capsid have an an envelope, so it's envelope. And so that we can see how that fits in with these different viruses. One thing that's really interesting is that if you're a naked virus and you just have the capsid, okay, which would be for humans, if you just have the capsid, you would be a, an icosahedral virus. There's a protein, a virally encoded protein on the surface of the virus particle or virion. If you are a envelope virus, you have virally encoded proteins embedded in the envelope. So in each case, there's information in your genome to make a 
virally encoded protein on the surface. Now, that's really interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, why would you stick that out there? That's the thing that the immune system can see. So essentially, you're putting something out there that the body can react to and say, this doesn't belong here. I can attack you. So why would a virus want to do that? Well, that's the way in which the virus can get into a new cell. So that outermost protein, which I call the tropogen because it determines the tropism or the type of cell that a virus can infect, that outer protein determines the cell type. It often determines what species the virus can infect, and many viruses are species-specific, and it determines the immune response to the virus. So the virus, even though it has to have a viral encoded protein, will go to some lengths to actually protect itself from being attacked by the immune system. So one of the fun things about these types of conversations is everything kind of interrelates and and we meander around and hit different topics. And what's coming to mind here is you hear this concept of viruses attacking cells that there has to be a fit, like the receptor on the cell has to match the virus. Is that essentially what you're talking about here? Or is that another layer? Oh, yes. So basically, when... A lot of biology involves interactions between proteins and proteins or proteins and other molecules. So often when these proteins interact, they form new bonds and they change shape. And shape determines function. So when two proteins interact, they change shape, they change function. And so suddenly they, the new shape of the protein allows them to enter the cell. And in the cartoons, in the media, normally you see viruses injecting their genetic material into a cell. There are some viruses of bacteria that can do that. And essentially all the viruses that infect humans, what happens is the virus actually coaxes or forces the cell to take them up. So they, the whole particle actually enters the cell. So they don't leave their protein coat or capsid behind. They actually take the whole thing enters the cell. And so it's this interaction between the viral protein on the surface, the tropogen, and the molecule on the surface of the cell. That means that a virus can't get into any old cell. It has to get into a cell that has a molecule or a protein on its surface that can interact with the virus. So again, if we think about SARS-CoV-2, the outermost protein which most people have heard of, we refer to as the spike protein. So the spike protein for SARS-CoV-2 is the tropogen. The spike protein has to interact with a cell protein. And we actually know the main cell protein it interacts with, which is the this thing called the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. Okay, that doesn't matter. We call it the ACE2 receptor. So it turns out only cells that have a ACE2 receptor that can bind with the virus can let the virus in. So we wouldn't see SARS-CoV-2, for instance, infecting plants or insects because they don't have that receptor. They don't need that protein. Even among animals, it's limited to ones that have an ACE2 receptor that looks like the human ACE2 receptor. So for many viruses, the interaction, the protein on the surface of the cell is very specific. So if you think about something like HIV, the HIV interacts with a protein on the cell that's pretty unique to humans. And so you don't see HIV infecting a range of different animals. But for SARS-CoV-2, the ACE2 receptor is pretty conserved in evolution. So that means this virus seems to be able to infect a number of different animals. Or for instance, if we were to talk about influenza, influenza is primarily a bird virus that can also infect mammals. So for some viruses, you have a broad host range For other viruses, you have a very narrow host range. And it depends on this interaction between the protein on the surface of the virus and the molecule on the surface of the cell. For instance, influenza interacts with a sugar that's found on many different cells. And so it can get into a range of different cells and a range of different species. So given that you mentioned the ACE2 receptor has been, I think you said, conserved in evolution in a lot of different species. So does that then mean that there are many more viruses that could potentially jump species or cross over because of this type of receptor, like viruses that attack or attach to ACE2 in particular? Yes. So the receptors, there, first of all, there's a lot of viruses out there. There's a lot of coronaviruses out there. 
many of them may use the ACE2 receptor or another receptor. And so the, the potential for infecting humans with animal viruses is still very broad. And we haven't begun to see the different possibilities. And I, actually, just as an aside, the virus that has one of the broadest host ranges is actually rabies. And that's because it uses a receptor that's a brain receptor that is found in all mammals. And so basically that virus can infect all mammals. One thing is you might want to say, it seems like it'd be better to have a broad range receptor. You can infect lots and lots of different animals. That seems like a great strategy. But in fact, it's actually usually a good strategy to actually be very specific. And it's like having a job. Okay, you might say if you can do five different jobs or you can do 50 different jobs, you're really employable. But in fact, if you can do one job really well and really specifically and hone down onto that, you're usually more employable. So for many viruses, the strategy is you get really good infecting one type of cell. If you think about it, though, both of those strategies work. So what often happens with viruses is you'll get a diversity of behaviors based on the fact that some of them will be broad range and their specificity will be a jack of all trades and other viruses will be very specialized. So getting back to the question of, are there more viruses that can out there that can infect humans? The answer is absolutely. And I assume it can go in the other direction as well, that humans could transfer a virus back to an animal. Absolutely. So one of the things that's happening with SARS-CoV-2 is this is primarily a bat virus. And accidentally got into humans. And it just turned out it could infect humans. It wasn't nearly as good when it first got into humans and it's learning how to be better and better at infecting humans basically every day. That's what all these new variants are about. And the reason why it's changing so rapidly is never saw humans before, but now that it sees humans, it's getting better and better at it. And that's what viruses do. They get better at their jobs. And so one of the consequences of that is a lot of humans are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Now, because humans hang out with so many domesticated animals and other animals, it turns out that animals that never would have had contact with bats before are now having contact with this new version of SARS-CoV-2 that's spreading around humans. And so what's happened is humans have now spread this to all kinds of different animals that have a very similar ACE2 receptor. Yeah, I've seen some news reports of everything from cats to white-tailed deer now infected with some variant of SARS-CoV-2. So it's now infected all these different creatures. The implications for humans are is a little bit unclear. So there's some viruses like herpes simplex viruses that can infect other creatures, but it doesn't actually become resonant in those other creatures and it doesn't start at, to evolve in those other creatures. And so we, other creatures that happen to get infected, for instance, in the laboratory with herpes simplex, don't really pose a risk to humans. And so the question is, are all these different animals that are infected with SARS-CoV-2, do they pose a risk to humans? And the answer is maybe. So they might serve as a reservoir. So if we got rid of SARS-CoV-2 in all humans, maybe it could come back into humans from animals. The other thing is it might start to evolve separately in these other animals and create new variants, which can then recombine with the human version and produce a variant that we haven't seen before. So those are the possibilities. Or it may turn out that it's more like herpes simplex. And if we got rid of it in humans, it would basically fade away in the animal populations as well. So the answer is the extent to which these other animal populations pose a risk to humans is not known right now. Yeah. And I guess I was also thinking about how we pose a risk to animal populations as well. It makes me wonder, is there a precedent out there for this type of behavior? I guess you were comparing to, to herpes viruses, but I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that this is just such a broad and complex field that there's probably a lot unknown about viruses and other animals and where, what their points of origin were. Yeah. So when we find we're obviously focused a lot more on human viruses and they're on our radar screen. So we often will track down human viruses. The animal viruses get the most attention are ones that are in agricultural animals. So if there happens to be a big die off in some species, we, we may not know about the virus. We're really concerned about viruses, for instance, that infect honeybees because honeybees are agriculturally important. So we tend to be human centric, including the things that involve our food and our pets and things like that. When you were talking about the classification of viruses, 
and going down that path. I was wondering about like when we hear about influenza, there are different types of influenza, different categorizations, like all the way down to say H1N1 or H2N3. I don't even know if that's a real one, but what is that representing back in your taxonomy of viruses that you were talking about before? So you're asking about the taxonomy of viruses. And until recently, we used to classify viruses at the family level. And family level is something where the viruses all look alike. They all have the same properties that we we're talking about before. They all have the same kinds of gene expression. And then because humans love to classify things and because we're learning more and more about the genetic structure of viruses, the, we've added some higher level classifications and also some intermediate and lower level classifications. And so first we started adding the level above families, which is order. And then about two years ago, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses actually decided we're going to go all the way. We're going to classify viruses all the way from most of our organisms that we're familiar with are classified kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And then above that, we put in domains. And so they decided to give every virus basically a realm and then go down kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we have added a lots of different classifications. In fact, the current ICTV classification involves what's called 15 ranks. So 15 levels of classification. Wow. Getting back to your question, once we get from the family level, then we can have groups of viruses that are what are called genera, so a genus of viruses, and then we can get individual viruses or species of viruses. Now, within species, we can subdivide that up and we can get into, you know, essentially what would be races. But that terminology differs a little bit from one kind of virus to another. But if you think about, for instance, for SARS, again, it's useful to think about SARS or flu in this regard because we're a little bit more familiar with this. So, for instance, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus. It's a species. Okay. SARS or SARS-1 is a different species. And so that's the level. Okay. But within SARS-CoV-2, we're now looking at different groups of viruses within SARS-CoV-2. And so we have different sort of isolates or groups and we have Delta and Omicron, things like that. And what we're doing is we're subclassifying those. And then we have different groups within Omicron. And for our purposes, those are really important. And what those usually mean is they are seen by our immune system as different viruses. So if you have, for instance, there are three different really similar viruses that can cause polio, polio one, two, and three. In terms of their genetic makeup, they look like they should be the same species and they are. But in terms of our immune system, you can get paralytic disease from any one of those or all three. And so in terms of both clinically and epidemiologically, some of those fine distinctions really matter a lot. It gets even more complicated with flu because for flu, we have these different groups of flu that are characterized by the proteins are, that are on their surface of their envelope. So we were talking about that before. And flu has two proteins on the surface of the virus particle. One is hemagglutinin, and we just call that H. And the other is neuraminidase, and then we call that N. And we can talk about what the function of those are, but we classify all viruses until which H and which N. And so one group are called H1N1, okay? And they're circulating around in humans right now. But within H1N1, our immune system can distinguish between different H1N1s. And so you could have had H1N1 and mount an immune response and be immune to that H1N1, but it could be that the virus changes and you're now going to be infected with a different H1N1. And so you could be, even just because it's H1N1, there are different isolates. So we actually name the isolates. And that's the reason why we have to get vaccinated every year for flu is that the virus keeps evolving. It's not that our immune response has decreased. Our immune response does fall off over time. But the main reason we have to get revaccinated for flu is that it's a different flu, even though it might still be H1N1. And right now, we typically get vaccinated for three different strains of flu or four different strains of flu every time we get vaccinated. So we get vaccinated for one group of H1N1s, the currently circulating one. We get vaccinated for one group of H3N2. And yes, you were right about that. And we get vaccinated for a whole different type of influenza called influenza B. So those are both influenza A. So again, it turns out that there's a lot to viral classification 
And you could say, who cares? And the answer is your immune system cares and your body cares. And so we are a little bit more picky about these fine details about classification when they infect our own health. Makes sense. So I just want to repeat and make sure I understood. So when we're talking about H1N1, we're already at, roughly speaking, a subspecies level. And then within H1N1, we have all of these other isolates that are important to track. So H1N1 and H3N2 are both a species of influenza called influenza A. Yep. Got it. Yeah. And again, that just it paints a picture of the immense world of virology. You, you we're just looking at one here and able to break it down into so many different viruses. Like in most fields, there's a lot of detail here. And again, some of the detail really matters, particularly if you're get the right vaccine or whether or not you get sick. And so some of that really matters. I think that for people who are not going to spend their life in virology, the thing that matters is understanding that subtlety exists. And that's true for all of biology, all of ecology. It's not that you need to learn all that, but you need to appreciate the fact that exists and that, and sometimes that actually matters. The question is, if you have different species that you're trying to protect in the environment, not viruses, but anything, does that matter? You know, does, is one finch the same as another finch or is one subspecies of song sparrow the same as another species? And we try to avoid subtlety when we talk to the press or communicating. But the fact is, I think one of the things to communicate is that subtlety is important. And that's something I love to do here on the podcast, because I think that the current state of media really drives people towards having sound bites and you lose all that subtlety. So I think one thing that comes to mind, you know, we're talking about viruses in the context of a taxonomy and they evolve and so forth. What is the theory as to the origin of viruses? Like wh when did they first appear on the landscape of Earth? You can answer that question in a bunch of different levels. At the most interesting level in a way is that if you look at human viruses, human viruses come from other viruses. We might be looking and saying, oh, SARS-CoV-2 just entered the human population from bats. Because humans are new on the scene and viruses have been around for a long time, we basically could track every single human viruses either to recent history or to more ancient history. For instance, smallpox probably came from, it's actually probably a rodent virus, but it may have entered humans through, through cows or other sort of livestock. And so because of the fact that humans hang out with lots of other animals, that they can get their viruses. So at the most interesting and important level, viruses come from other viruses. And you can say that about species as well. Now, when Darwin was talking about the origin of species, he never got bored down to where does life come from? He was just saying, where's, where's, how do you get from one species to another? In fact, he really had trouble even getting that far. So he was just talking about how changes occur. And one thing that's really important is that most viruses that infect humans probably don't go back to the beginning of time. They probably are newer viruses, either from animals or even just came into existence. So now, if we want to go back to the question of where did the original virus come from? Now, for many creatures, we now have this really powerful tool where we can sequence their genetic material and we can put all the different living things into a, a big tree based on how closely related their DNA is. And that has been a very effective method. For instance, if you look at plants, only recently have we applied classification using genetic material. And so a lot of the plants have been reclassified recently and their names of the plants that have been changed as a result of information from genetic material. Now, we can do that to a certain extent with viruses, but viruses evolve so fast that we can't really put them into a big tree in the same way. And so we can't really use the genetic material to go all the way back in time. So we can hypothesize of where did the first viruses come from. And there's several different theories. Okay. Now, one theory is viruses started out as cells and parasitism is a form of, of life, a form of making a living that is common and has emerged many times. And so in this hypothesis, you're saying you start as a cell, but you figured out you can get rid of a lot of your genetic material and just rely on other creatures to make your food for you or to do the essential work. And so you can get simpler and simpler because you're just going to live inside of a cell where life is good. And so that's one theory. So that's the degenerate cell hypothesis. A second theory is because 
some viruses have very few genes. Some of them only have three or four genes. And so you can imagine that a bunch of genes with the proper properties, for instance, they're able to make a protein coat or they're able to make a machine that can replicate the genetic material of the virus, get, get together accidentally and create a new virus, something that can now replicate inside the cell. So you take a bunch of genes from the cell, you put them together, and now you have a virus. And there aren't that many genes you have to put together to make a virus. And then from there, you can evolve and get more complicated or grab more genes from the cell. And so that's the assimilation model where you're basically a bunch of genes get together and form a club and they're now a virus. So that's another hypothesis. A third hypothesis is that basically viruses which exploit molecules in the environment may have preceded all of life. So if you think about viruses are really simple and we might kind of imagine this primordial soup which has all these different molecules that have accumulated sugars and fat molecules and and the building blocks of proteins which are amino acid and they've accumulated in these ponds and they figure out how to get together and start replicating and you know you create a few genes you now have a virus, so you don't actually, you're basically a parasite on the primordial soup. Now, thinking about that is a little hard for people today because we live in an environment where there's oxygen and things have to happen fast and things break down and degrade. But in the early earth, it was a very different environment. There was a lot of energy around. And so you could actually accumulate things over the course of thousands, millions of years. And so a reaction that might need to occur in a second today might take a hundred years. It might be highly improbable, but it could just, everything, the time scale might be slowed down by a million fold. And so that's another theory is that viruses sort of evolved along with living things in the primordial soup. And in fact, you might even think that life occurs when a bunch of viruses invent, find a membrane partner, or they find some other things and a bunch of viruses get together. And suddenly we have something that is, can replicate itself. So you have basically the first cell. So that's the third hypothesis. The fourth hypothesis is what I don't like very well, but there's actually a, a, was a prominent astronomer who perpetuated this idea that viruses come from space. Okay, so viruses have these protein coats and they can endure harsh environments. And so maybe some viruses arrived from somewhere else on an asteroid or something like that and got to Earth. The reason I don't like that hypothesis is not that it's not possible, But first of all, it's improbable. So the likelihood that a virus that could actually its way in in human life forms is is highly unlikely because we talked about the fact that viruses are really specialized for the environment in which they live. And the second thing is it just pushes the question back further and says, if that's how viruses came to Earth, how did they come to to exist on the asteroid? So it doesn't actually buy you anything. It just, it sounds cool. And people like to think about space and zombies and things like that. But (laughs) most of those don't actually buy you very much when it comes to viruses. So excluding the fourth hypothesis, for, in my simplistic view, thinking about this, I've seen and observed viruses in plants and in many different taxa. And when I start thinking about that and the precursor to animal life being plants and the precursor to plants being like simpler organisms. But I think that my point is it's pretty easy to see how viruses would have likely been in existence very early in this time sequence. Yes. So if you're asking me, where do the viruses that exist today come from? I would probably, so let me go through each of those hypotheses. I suspect that viruses predate cellular life and actually were instrumental in creating cellular life. But because the evolutionary lifespan of a virus is relatively short compared to other life forms, it's likely that those progenitor viruses don't exist anymore in in the form that you would recognize. So you couldn't take a virus today and look back at its evolutionary history unless you could look at the cell and it's buried in evolutionary time. And so what about the viruses today? So I think the majority of viruses that infect humans probably arose from the assimilation model. You got a bunch of genes that got together and they can replicate. We even find things that are simpler than viruses that are like, for instance, jumping genes. They don't have a capsid, but they've figured out how how to replicate themselves and move from one piece of DNA to another piece of DNA within the cell. Oh, my gosh. So you have a series of precursors. Or in plants, we have this wonderful pathogen called a viroid. And the viroid is like a virus, but it doesn't have a capsid because 
its RNA wraps itself into a very tight form that resists degradation. So those little viroids can actually get from one cell to another. One of the things that Darwin looked at like the evolution of the eye. And he said, we think that this complicated thing could arise because if you look at other animals, you can see all kinds of things that look like intermediates. Well, we can see the same thing with sort of virus particles that, that could possibly come together. Now, what about the cellular degradation? And my theory is that there are a few big viruses that are complicated that actually I think may have evolved from degenerate cells. And those include the pox viruses. Now, pox viruses are huge, physically huge viruses that actually are as big as some of the smallest cellular organisms like chlamydia. So it's possible that some of the viruses that infect humans today had two different origins or possibly even three different origins. But I would, go, I would basically say most of them are probably assimilated genes that got together and a few of them may be degenerate cells like, like pox viruses. So that would be my, you know, again, my buy-in. And one thing that's interesting about pox viruses is they encode a few genes that no other viruses really encode. For instance, they encode a gene that allows them to make a protein that actually makes mRNA from DNA. So typically, other viruses all use the cell's machine for making mRNA from, a, from DNA. And that allows them a special property, and that is that these viruses can actually, are, it's a DNA virus that can replicate in the cytoplasm or the outer part of the cell, which most DNA viruses can't do. They need a nucleus. Okay, so we've been talking about viruses from the standpoint of what they are and how they replicate and a number of different perspectives. Now, where does the immune system come into play in terms of attempting to fight off these viruses? That brings up a whole bunch of really interesting things. Okay, so we think about these viruses which take over our cells as this, these evil little parasites. And, but if you think about this from the virus perspective, its, it's evolutionary goal is to make more viruses. So each virus is successful if it can produce more virus particles, if it can infect more cells, if it can infect more people. So if you were a virus that was really nasty and you came in contact with a person who killed them immediately, that would be a virus that would disappear from the earth because, because it doesn't benefit the virus. And so the virus actually has to be able to infect at least one other person in order to perpetuate itself. It needs to be able to spread. Now, there is various theories about, oh, viruses are going to become more benign as they stay in the human population or more aggressive. And the answer is, you really need to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. And for instance, even for a single virus, and we have a great example in uh, where they introduce a virus that infects rabbits in Australia to try to control the rabbit population. Is that myxomatosis? Yeah, myxomatosis. So even within that population, the virus will tend to get more or less virulent. And if there's lots of hosts, if there's lots of rabbits, it can actually be replicate really fast. And even if it kills the host, kills the rabbit, it'll be very successful. Okay. But as fewer and fewer rabbits occur or the population start to decrease, a really virulent virus won't be passed on because all the hosts will be killed. And so the probability of being spread to another rabbit is really small. And so the virus actually oscillates in its pathogenicity, in its, in its nastiness, in its spreadability based on how many hosts are available to infect. And so if you look at a virus like smallpox, it continued to be nasty, even though it's been infecting humans for thousands of years. And so there isn't necessarily this drive to always become more benign. So some viruses do become more benign over time, and some viruses don't. Now, what we're seeing right now with SARS-CoV-2 is it seems like the virus is becoming more benign over time. But if you think about a new variant that might occur, that completely different, the immune system doesn't recognize it, that can replicate really effectively, it could actually be more virulent. Okay. So you have to take each one of these cases so on an individual basis. Okay. So we have this system for basically trying to protect us from viruses. And in fact, we have this really cool immune system. And the question is, why do we have it? And the answer is probably because of viruses. So the immune system, which evolved, basically the vertebrate immune system obviously evolved long before humans did, probably as a response to trying to control viruses. Okay, so why do we see all these diseases then if we have this really great immune system? The answer is that the virus evolves very fast, much faster than the host. And so we're seeing the cases where the 
immune system has failed. So we are have a selection bias for nasty viruses that can spread in humans, okay? The ones that didn't make it, the ones that were weeded out by the immune system, they, they never enter our radar screen. They never come into our scientific labs or anything like that. So you are more likely to see nasty viruses than you are to see things that were effectively controlled by the immune system. So if we think about the immune system has several different branches and they actually correspond quite a bit to the different features of the virus. So for instance, when the virus comes in, there are certain things that are able to detect viruses. And one thing, for instance, we talked about the fact that RNA viruses have to make an RNA copy using a machine that they encode. And so there's at some point a phase in their life where there's double-stranded RNA. Well, if you think back to the central dogma, there's never double-stranded RNA in the central dogma. Our cells don't have double-stranded RNA in the same way that a virus would need to replicate. So we have detectors, sensors in our body to look for double-stranded RNA. And when we have it, the, uh, the immune system says, let's kill that cell because it's saying that potentially we have a viral infection or something bad. So we have detectors for viruses, features. We have some detectors for things that look like bacteria that don't look like us. All that stuff, which doesn't require knowing what specific virus just came onto the scene, all of that is called the innate immune system. So we have this whole system. It involves things like interferon and getting into your whole body into a state of alert. Is it fair to say if we have layers of defense with the immune system, that's a coarse-grained initial defense system? We have layers of defense. Our first defenses actually really don't involve the immune system per se. Those are barriers. We have skin. And so we only have a certain number of places where things can enter our body. We have like our mouth and our anus and our nose. And and so we only have a few portals of entry. And so different viruses have actually specialized themselves to getting into different portals of entry. So different modes of transmission. And so that's our first defense. And if you think about, for instance, viruses that cause gastroenteritis or infect the gastrointestinal tract, first of all, it's a great strategy for a virus because it never actually has to burrow through your skin. It just delivers itself like a donut where our, our gastrointestinal tract is actually topologically outside our body. So it's this great place for a virus and it can infect the cells there. So if we think about that, things that, that go into our intestines have to pass through the stomach. And so we have stomach acid. So each one of our different portals of entry has different sort of physical defenses that can protect ourselves. So the first level of defense is basically physical, physiological kinds of things. For instance, when you pee, it usually has enough pressure, particularly if you're younger, to actually sweep out any bacteria or viruses that are trying to get in there. And so one thing is if you get, if you have a catheter or if you get older and your urine flow is not as strong, that is particularly useful for bacteria. It's not a really great portal of entry for viruses, but again, that physiological defense sort of degrades with time. So the first level of defense is that. The second level might be this innate immune system where it immediately can jump into action and doesn't need any, there's no time lapse for it to get going. Then you have a system that says, I want to specifically attack the viruses that infect, that are infecting us, okay? there's millions of potential viruses that could attack us. And if you think about it, it would be nice to have a defense against every possible virus that could attack us and make antibodies, for instance, little molecules that can bind to those viruses. But we only have 22,000 genes or so. And if there's millions of viruses, we can't have a gene that can recognize every virus. It's not possible. In fact, we have to have most of those genes aren't involved in the immune system. Quite a few are, but most of them are not. And so we have this incredible system that allows us to generate diversity to different possible invaders. And so we keep a few cells for each of those different types in our body, and they wait around as kind of sentinels. If something that matches the sentinel for that is like polio virus, what that will do is the body will say, oh, we need to amplify and, and engage those cells that can recognize polio or that can recognize SARS-CoV-2 or, or recognize smallpox. So we have a potential army against lots of different theoretical things that might enter our body. Okay, so the body has no reason to know ahead of time that SARS-CoV-2 exists in the world, but it just has such a broad diversity. And so that system takes a little while to 
jump into action. We have to first recognize that we have to amplify those cells. Those cells become what are called effector cells. So they go from being detector cells into cells that might be able to carry out the business, the war business of taking care of the virus. So usually there's a lag there. And so you might get sick and the virus might be, if you think about the balance of power, the virus might be in control for a while. Hopefully the immune system kicks in before the virus takes over and causes serious disease or kills you. What we have here, though, is, as I said before, is that viruses have figured out ways to evade the immune system. All the ones that are that you hear about, RSV, those are viruses that have developed systems for evading the immune system. Can I pause you for a minute and back up? But when you mentioned detector cells, just to clarify, does that literally mean that the only thing they can do is detect this existence and signal to the immune system to ramp up the effector cells? Or are these detector cells actually able to do any fighting whatsoever against the virus? So the question about the detector cells, what's their function? So the first thing, several things about the detector cells. So the detector cells, they're through a process, real kind of an amazing process. We actually have millions of different specificities of detector cells, and they are just floating around. And so we don't have genes for them, but we actually have ways of recombining our genes into mix and match things and undergo mutations. And those detector cells, first thing they do is they they detect and then they can, and that we call that part of the immune system specificity. The second part of the feature of the immune system we call adaptability. And what happens is they double, they amplify, and then they differentiate and they go from being detector cells into being effector cells. So those same cells actually can become cells that are, that can either make antibodies or can kill virally infected cells. And then a third feature of the immune system that makes it absolutely incredible is the fact that they can remember what infected us. So you might have millions of specificity, but if you encountered polio once, you basically say, polio was awful. I live in a world where there's polio. I'm going to keep a higher proportion of my detector cells present. And so that feature of the immune system is called memory. And so the immune system has memory, the adaptive immune system has memory, but the innate immune system doesn't have any memory. It always detects the same thing and always starts from the same point. So that memory is what we're actually can trick when we create vaccines. We're trying to convince the immune system that it's seen a virus or it's seen a bacteria or seen a, a pathogen before, but it's never actually seen it. And so that way we can increase the level of these of these detector cells. And we'll and so they can more much more rapidly differentiate into effector cells. And so what we're doing is we're decreasing the lag time for the for this highly powerful adaptive immune system to jump into action. Got it. So then in the press we often hear about T cells and B cells. Where do they fit then in this framework of the immune system that you just laid out? Just to back up a second, the adaptive immune system, which is going to involve T cells and B cells, as you talk about, also interacts with the innate immune response. And for instance, in innate immune response, you have certain cells that are just going around the body and gobbling things up and putting those pieces of proteins and the pieces of virus on their surface. And basically, they're asking the smart B cells and T cells or detector cells, do we have something going on here? And so we have cells that are called antigen presentation cells. And they are part of the innate immune system because they don't know whether there's anything there, but they interact with the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system consists primarily of a type of cell called a lymphocyte or a white blood cell. And these white blood cells, these lymphocytes, they come in two main varieties, which are called B cells and T cells. And T cells are sub subsequently subdivided into various types of cells and B cells are subsequently divided. It's never simple and we should appreciate the subtleties that are going on here. Now, B cells, when they detect something, they actually will increase in number and they will differentiate and they will change into a new type of cell. And that type of cell looks different and has a different function it has the same specificity, but has a different function. And that function is to make antibodies. The type of cell that they turn into is called a plasma cell. And a plasma cell is basically an antibody producing factory, which will make tons and tons of antibodies with exactly the same specificity that they originally detected. Now, in the T cells, we have an important subdivision, and that is we have a type of T cell called 
a T helper cell. And those T helper cells are like the commanders of the immune system. They tell everybody what to do. So you might think of those as the conductor of the immune orchestra, or the chief bureaucrat that just tells everybody what to do, let's do that much themselves. And T cells basically stimulate other types of cells. So they also will amplify up if they see the, the correct antigen. If, they, if the antigen on that specific T cell, we have millions of specificity of T cell, then you'll get more of these helper T cells. Now, the effector part of the T cell immune system is called, these are called, it's not an easy term, but they're called cytotoxic T cells or T killer cells. And cytotoxic T cells can recognize virally infected cells and they amplify up and they get more aggressive. So they get to be, go from detector cells to being these killer T cells. And again, you have millions of specificities of those. So now if you think about it, we have these huge populations, one that makes antibodies and those antibodies can combine with extracellular virus, the virions, the inert phase. And then we have another part of the immune system, which involves cell mediated immunity, basically these cytotoxic T cells. And that can detect infected cells and attack cells when they are in the dynamic phase, where they're inside of cells to actually destroy those cells. So what it'll do is it'll kill our own cells because it'll say, this cell is infected and it's a goner and I don't want to make more viruses so that more cells get killed. So those two branches, and you'll hear a lot about them with regard to SARS-CoV-2 because you can mount an antibody response to viruses and you can mount the T-cell response. And one thing that we couldn't necessarily predict it ahead of time is the fact that the T-cell response to SARS-CoV-2 seems to have broad specificity. So even though we're using a vaccine, primarily against the ancestral strain of SARS-CoV-2, it's still good enough to protect us from really serious disease. The antibodies, which have a lot more specificity, seem to be more variant dependent. So as the variants change, the antibodies become less and less effective. And one consequence of that is that we actually have a therapy against SARS-CoV-2 that involves giving people antibodies that are made in the laboratory. And they have to go through all kinds of testing and FDA approval. And so for a while, for instance, when the variant was Delta, those monoclonal antibodies that are made in the laboratory were pretty good at, at controlling the infection. Now, the monoclonal antibodies that are available to us can no longer control the Omicron variants that are circulating. So I think this is just so amazing to hear and gives a good idea of the different layers of defense and how things are working. And Early on in this pandemic, as variants started to come to light, I painted myself a picture that maybe is incorrect, and I, I would like your opinion on it. And that's with each successive exposure to a different variant, we grow a um, improved memory and a more diverse set of antibodies that eventually will actually help us to counteract future variants. Is that accurate or is this virus, I mean, I shouldn't paint it as an either or, but like, is it also possible the virus just keeps mutating way beyond what we've currently seen? Yes. So that brings up, just like most things, that brings up a whole several new lines of like things that are worth thinking about. And one thing is that if you think about just not at a high level of evolution, but if you think about how can this virus evolve in terms of being able to spread there's two main ways that the virus will change. One is it can become intrinsically more contagious. It can become an intrinsically better virus at spreading. And if you're better at spreading, you will come to predominate in the population. This is basically natural selection in action. It's not really survival of the fittest. It's survival of those individuals that are most reproductive. And that's true, not just for viruses, for humans as well, or for any living thing. It's not who's strongest or more beautiful. It's who can produce the most offspring. So that's one way is you can be intrinsically better at producing offspring. And to our surprise, this virus keeps getting intrinsically better and better at infecting cells and infecting people. It's becoming the most intrinsically transmissible virus that we've ever met. Okay, That distinction is held by measles which is like the Michael Jordan of viruses. But, but this virus is knocking at the door of all the records that are being held by measles. Now, the other way that you can become spread throughout the population is 
if everybody in the population is immune to a certain strain of virus, for instance, a certain strain of COVID-2, and you have a strain that may not be as intrinsically contagious, but you can infect people who are already immune, you will win the game because if everybody's infected, that old virus won't get anywhere, but the new virus can continue to infect those people over and over again. And that's typically what flu does. And to our surprise, this virus, which is quite capable of doing that, hasn't really used that strategy as much, but it will in the future. It's almost guaranteed that it will use ants that are not necessarily intrinsically more contagious, but are immune evasive that can get around the immune system. So that's so one reason why we're probably going to have this for a while. Now, the other thing to look at is what's special about SARS-CoV-2. And one thing is that SARS-CoV-2 is in a family of viruses known as the coronaviruses. And it's based on their shape. We've all seen pictures where there's these spikes sticking out from the surface. And so somebody thought that looked like a crown in an electron micrograph. And so they called it a coronavirus or crown virus. So coronaviruses among the RNA viruses have the biggest genomes. They have the most genes of any RNA virus. What are those genes? It doesn't have an extra machine for replicating. It doesn't necessarily have an extra capsid protein or spike protein. It's pretty similar to other viruses in that regard. What it has is a lot of small proteins. And some of those proteins modulate the host response. They modulate the immune system and prevent us from mounting an effective immune response. And so one thing is that it's likely and hasn't really been studied enough that people who get infected with coronavirus are less protected than people who get vaccinated for coronavirus. Because when you get vaccinated, you mount an immune response, but you don't have these immune modulating proteins that are also present. When you get infected, you have a huge amount of spike protein, but you also have all these other proteins that are fiddling around with your immune system. And it's, that's worth talking about as well. You know, in a way, you can think about this in a broader context, and that is that many organisms have these interactions with their with other organisms in the environment. So certainly viruses want to interact with their hosts in order to be most effective at producing progeny. This virus can has some special tricks to evade the immune response. Now, one other bit that's worth talking about is the fact that viruses mutate at a fairly high rate. And RNA viruses mutate at a very high rate because when DNA replicates itself, it has what's called a proofreading function that goes back and tries to make sure there's as few mistakes as possible. An RNA machine replicates RNA. It doesn't have that proofreading function, so it makes lots of mistakes. So viruses have the potential, particularly RNA viruses, to evolve very quickly. Now, a variant is a series of mutations that are more successful than its predecessors. And so if you think about the mutation rate for RNA viruses, it's really high. But if you think about the evolution of, every, of RNA viruses, it's a bit slower, but it's still pretty fast. Now, coronaviruses, again, are unique because they're the only RNA viruses that we know about that have a proofreading function. So they actually are a little bit more accurate at replicating their genome. But again, there's still plenty of mistakes that create sort of the fodder for evolution. So if you look about something like measles also makes a lot of mistakes when it replicates, but it's basically stayed immunologically the same. So we've used the same vaccine for measles for decades and it still works. Whereas for coronavirus, that's just not true. You just gave really good context as to why the measles vaccine is still effective all these years later. And also, we're talking a lot about coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2. So why, why all the press about mRNA vaccines? Can you tell me a little bit about what an mRNA vaccine is, how it works? Yeah, so I just gave a talk on mRNA vaccines. I'm going to back up before I answer that question. I'm going to back up a little bit because I am primarily a, an educator and particularly an educator with regard to virology. And so I am really struck by the extent to which narratives play a role in what we know about viruses and about coronaviruses and things like that. And so we've heard a lot about the mRNA vaccine narrative. And so I might frame this question about what's the scoop on the mRNA vac vaccine narrative? Why are mRNA vaccines so special? And why are they going to produce almost inevitably a series of Nobel Prizes? Okay. So that's a great question. Now there's a whole 
bunch of things about mRNA narrative that I think are are either misleading or completely false. The first thing is this idea that in record time, we figured out how to make an mRNA vaccine and how to make an mRNA vaccine for this virus. So there's a little bit of truth to that, but there's also a really huge backstory. The first part of the backstory is that there are several people who had been working on mRNA vaccines for a very long period of time particularly Caitlin Carrico, who she was a professor on a tenure track and she basically got demoted. So she was no longer a tenure track because everybody said, your work is not panning out. But she thought it was so important that she persisted in working on these mRNA vaccines. So there was a lot of background work. And part of the story is going to be the importance of basic research, whether it's in virology or whether it's in ecology or anyway, because it's going to play out in important ways later on. The second part of that story is that people have been working on vaccines for coronaviruses for quite a while. And what happened was, first of all, SARS came and went, although SARS could come back. And so people were interested in that. And then MERS came and went, but MERS could still be a potential problem. And so people have been working on how do we make a vaccine for something like MERS? Just to interject, coronaviruses were on the radar because of SARS and MERS already And I think that those were the shots across the bow, basically, that we should be prepared for another coronavirus. Absolutely. So we've been known about coronaviruses for a fairly long period of time. People were dismissive about coronaviruses because they caused the common cold. And then the shot across the bow occurred when SARS emerged. And what SARS was a coronavirus that was not causing the common cold that was killing people. And so we called, we actually started calling that a pandemic coronavirus because it was causing spreading around the world and it was very dangerous. And then MERS came along and here's a second pandemic coronavirus. And so after they went away, people continued to study it and they accumulated an incredible amount of information about these two viruses, which to a certain extent, we've been more focused on clinical stuff and things like that. And so I think we haven't done nearly as much basic research on SARS-CoV-2 because the problem is still right with us. The pandemic virus is still spreading. Now, several other lines of research, basic research that have been really important. And now I want to talk a little bit about envelope viruses in general. So envelope viruses have a virally encoded protein in their surface, which we talked about, which allows them to get into a new cell and get into a new host, okay? And it turns out envelope proteins are floppy. And floppy proteins are not well recognized by the immune system. So envelope viruses are not nearly as well recognized by the immune system. One group decided, what if we could make a modified protein that was rigid, that wasn't so floppy? And so what they added was they added these slightly different structural agents, so an amino acid called proline. And by adding these two prolines, they were able to get much more rigid envelope proteins. And so that technology had also been applied to the MERS vaccine. So we had a potential MERS candidate with a double proline modification with very good antigen. So what happened with mRNA vaccines is we first heard about SARS-CoV-2 on December 31st, 2019. And that it had already been spreading. So at that point, it was already causing an epidemic in China. It was already a very serious virus that was spreading. The Chinese were on high alert for this, but we just heard about it on the last day. And that's why it became COVID-19 because of 2019. Now, the Chinese had already been doing research and 10 days later, mind-blowing, the Chinese published the sequence, the entire sequence of the genome of coronavirus, this big RNA virus. And the day that that occurred, so the Americans were already like gearing up because they knew there was a problem. Here's this thing spreading in China. The day they got that, a guy named Barney Graham sent this to one of his colleagues and they said, we can use what we know about the MERS vaccine, and we can make an analogous vaccine using the two proline modification. And so they created in essentially one day a potential vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. And what they did was they said, we need somebody who can make a lot of this stuff. Let's call this company that's doing mRNA vaccines, Moderna, 
and let's give them our sequence, our potential vaccine. And again, within a very short period of time, within weeks, they were already producing the vaccine. And we can talk about what's special about mRNA vaccines, which is really your question. And so in a very short period of time, it was in humans and it was in human clinical trials. And by the time the year ended, we already had done large scale human clinical trials to show that the vaccine was wildly effective, more effective than anybody could have imagined. In fact, the FDA wanted a 50% efficacy as the bar to get over in order to issue an emergency use authorization. And this had more than 90% efficacy. So it was wildly effective. But people were also making vaccines using these double proline mutations using, for instance, an adenovirus vector. And they were also doing it using purified protein. So several other people were making vaccines using this this modified spike protein. And I think the modified spike protein is a key and essential feature to why this vaccine works so well. And okay, so one thing that is really important to talk about is the fact that the real vaccine here is the spike protein. The mRNA or the adenovirus or the whatever other kind of vaccine is the delivery system for making that spike protein. So you can make it with other systems. And we would have had a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, even if there weren't mRNA vaccines. It might have taken a little bit longer. Okay, so let's go back and say, why is mRNA easy to make? Because the mRNA that's using these vaccines is basically made by a machine. So you don't need cells or anything to make it like you typically need for mRNA. And so we basically type in the sequence and get into a computer. We give it to the machine and it starts cranking out mRNA sequences. And in this case, the machine is only creating the spike protein. It's not creating the rest of the machinery of the virus. It's creating the message for the proline modified spike protein. And furthermore, because mRNA is easily degraded in biological systems, because again, cells don't want to see mRNA hanging around, the mRNA is not real mRNA. It's modified mRNA. So it's harder to break down. It's been modified both in terms of the sequence of the gene that it's going to encode, but it's also the structure of the MR itself is not biological mRNA. So it's more stable. So the other thing is you need to stick it in a carrier system so cells will take it up. And so we have this lipid carrier system. If you think about it, all those elements went into making, for instance, Moderna or the essentially identical Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine differs in the lipid carrier, for instance, but, but those are both very similar vaccines. So the first sort of part of the narrative that I think is not quite right is that we wouldn't have a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine if it weren't for mRNA. The second part is that it's not the mRNA that actually is the vaccine. It's the thing that the mRNA encodes that creates the antigen that's used in the vaccine. The third thing is that because it's mRNA, it doesn't modify our DNA in any way. That's that's another important thing. Now, the fourth thing is that, and this is a subtlety that I think is important and nobody's really talking about it. If we back up and we think about the history of vaccines, there are two main types of vaccines. Vaccines where a weakened virus infects a cell and produces the antigen that's going to be the vaccine. And there's other vaccines where we just take the protein and we inject it into the body. And it's going to be picked up by this, those antigen presenting cells and going to be shown to the immune system. It turns out the immune response that you make from proteins that are made in our cells is stronger and slightly more diverse in better in a number of ways than the immune response we make from purified protein. So if you think about the polio vaccine, There are two versions of the polio vaccine. Most people know them as the Sabin vaccine and the Salk vaccine. The Salk vaccine is killed virus. So it's just protein that the cells are picking up and presenting to the immune system. The Sabin vaccine is a weakened form of polio virus that the cells are actually making the viral protein. Now, if you think about mRNA vaccines, it's the best of both worlds. So what's going to happen is the cells are going to take up the mRNA and they are going to produce the protein themselves. So you're going to get the more robust immune response with an mRNA vaccine that's similar to a live vaccine, as opposed to something like Novavax, which is just purified protein, which is going to make the type 2 response. Now, having been vaccinated 
with the vaccine before, I think that the purified protein might be a great booster. Okay. It would be less controversial in various ways and things like that. So I think we, we need to give a lot of thought to this purified protein vaccine. Given the power of mRNA vaccines and then maybe optionality with other types of vaccines to act as boosters, is there any chance of eradicating SARS-CoV-2 at this point? Like my assumption is no, it's just, it's out there saturating the population and it's in animal reservoirs like you were talking about, but what's your answer? Okay, so I think about this a lot. I think the general conception, even among experts, is that the horse has left the barn and that it's too late to eradicate this thing. I actually have a sort of the minority opinion. Okay, I think, first of all, it's useful to know that we've eradicated a few other viruses before. Usually you'll hear that we've only eradicated one virus and that's smallpox. We've actually eradicated two of the three strains of polio so polio is a lot harder virus to eradicate, and we've gotten rid of two, and we're on the verge of getting rid of the third one as well. So we have three examples. We also have an animal virus called rinderpest, and that's an interesting example too, because, okay, here we're going to eradicate not just from people where we know what they're doing, but also from livestock and wild animals as well. So we have a number of examples where things have been eradicated. I can state right off the bat that vaccine technology, the therapeutics, and the diagnostic technology that are available to us for SARS-CoV-2 are better than anything we've ever had for any other virus. So that's in our favor. Other people will say there's just too many people have infected. This virus is too clever. So maybe, you know, it's too late. Or other people will say it's got a short incubation, a very short incubation, and it's replicating in our respiratory tract, which is less available to the immune system. You know, we might stop serious disease, but we're not going to stop transmission from one person to another. Okay, so my opinion is maybe, but I can tell you for sure that we can't eradicate this virus if we don't try. And I can tell you that if we were to eradicate this virus from an economic standpoint, from a technological standpoint, from a human triumph standpoint, that would be amazing. So why is it that when it comes to technology, like the computer technology, we say anything is possible. When it comes to space technology, anything is possible. But when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, let's just give up. And the other thing is, as I said before, it's possible that animal reservoirs will be a huge problem for us, that, that we won't be able to do it because it'll keep entering the human population. And so maybe we don't know that. So I am really of the idea that we should try. Secondly, the probability that this will mutate into a new variant or a new strain or something that's dangerous is directly a function of how many people are infected and how many cells are infected. Every time a cell gets infected, it's an opportunity to generate a new dangerous variant, one that can either be intrinsically more contagious or one that can be immune evasive. It would be great for all of us if the transmission was less, if the number of people were less. We would be able to, when we went to gatherings that where people weren't wearing a mask, our risk of getting infected would be less. So I see lots of reasons to give this a try and to put a lot of effort into it. One of the main things that's standing in our way is not technology, is not economics, but actually the fact that we live in a world where, as Patrick Moynihan said, everybody's allowed to their own opinion, but you're not allowed your own facts. But we now live in a world where everybody's allowed their own facts. And so that's standing in the way of basically eradicating this. So I am more persuaded that this may not be eradicated because we don't have the will to do it and we, that we don't have the technology to do it. And if we couldn't do it in the past, that doesn't matter because the technology is improving with amazing speed. So again, I'm optimist about the biological possibility and I'm a pessimist about the reality of whether we can make that happen. Interesting perspective. And I think that societal component was weighing into my preface on the question <laughs> as well, just looking at the reality of the world that we live in right now, unfortunately. But yeah, you're right. I like the perspective and the optimism that you bring to that question. Why not? There's a lot of things, there's a lot more discoveries and advancements that would be made and would be beneficial for future pandemics if it were given a try. And then just Riffing off a little bit of that, I think that the basic research aspect of SARS-CoV-2 is critically important. So one, one thing that has obsessed me 
is the fact that these small proteins in SARS-CoV-2, many of them, we don't even know their entire function. We don't know necessarily all the proteins they interact with in the cell. And I think these proteins are super important because I think they're the reason why, for instance, early in the pandemic, our immune system overreacted to the virus. And often people would die and they would be no longer producing virus. It was their immune system that was killing them. I also think that it's possible, at least this is my theory of long COVID, is that the body has basically reacted to these, essentially, that coronavirus protein. And we basically overreacted, reset our immune system so it thinks we're under attack even after we're no longer under attack. So the virus is gone, but the immune system is still acting like the virus is there. And so it may turn out that if we study those, we can figure out a way to reset the immunostat, the thermostat to the immune system so that we can cure them. Right now, most of the therapies that are being used for long COVID and basically for chronic fatigue syndrome are things that are symptomatically based. And so I think we need to get way beyond that. If SARS-CoV-2, this little machine, has caused this complex disease, the place to look is to see how did this little machine that's understandable give rise to this complicated syndrome. And so I think you need to look back at the virus rather than at the patient to see what's going on here. And I think that, again, the economic impact of doing something like that would be tremendous. So I would say, put your money on all these little proteins that SARS, that coronaviruses in general, but SARS-CoV-2 is making. Do you see any efforts underway or funding that's helping in this basic research front? So that's an interesting question. I don't see the kinds of publications coming out that I would like to see. But one thing is that people could be doing intensive research and sometimes we just don't see it until they write their publication. And so it may be that people are actively working on this, but we're not seeing a lot of this research in the news. And there, there is a site called Viral Zone. And for anybody who wants to learn some basics about virology, that's a great site to look at. And Viral Zone has this one thing where it has what they refer to as the interactome of SARS-CoV-2. And the interactome is every protein in SARS-CoV-2 and what other proteins for the virus and what other proteins for the cells interacting with. And they're just huge gaps where we just don't know what these proteins are doing. And so, yeah, the research may be going ongoing, but I'm not seeing it Mm. in places where I would typically look for that kind of research. So you mentioned that in long COVID, it might be that your immune system is out of whack. It's still responding. Can you give me other examples where something like this happens? We have a selection bias in seeing viruses that tend to be pretty dangerous because they can evade the immune response. We also have a selection bias for when the immune system fails and is too active. Okay. So these are diseases of immunological excess. So the immune system usually does a great job, but sometimes it overreacts. And there's a whole bunch of different examples where we know the immune system overreacts. One, some common examples that many of us have experienced are things like allergies or hay fever or asthma. Those are systems in which your immune system is producing a response that's not helpful. And that's a certain part of the immune system that involves a certain type of antibody. Yeah, we said we can subdivide the antibodies. These are what are called immunoglobulin E antibodies. There's another whole class of diseases where the immune system overreacts, and those are autoimmune diseases. So your body has this very elaborate system for telling what's supposed to be there, what's self, and what's not supposed to be there, non-self. And so if you detect something that's non-self, you try to attack those. And so autoimmune disease is an example where your body makes a mistake and it starts attacking your own cells. And those are things like type 1 diabetes, where we're starting to attack the cells to make insulin. Or it might be something like multiple sclerosis, where we're we're attacking the cells that line the neurons in our brain, and we're basically destroying that the myelin covering that surrounds neurons. So there's a whole bunch of these. There's another group that are called delayed hypersensitivity reactions. In in that case, the T cells, not the antibodies, but the T cells, overreact to something. And the classic example of that would be something like poison oak, or we have an immune response to some chemical, a soap or something like that. And those present very differently. For instance, if you think about an allergy or hay fever, the response is almost immediate. If you think about this response, 
it actually usually takes 24 to 48 hours. So if you're exposed to poison oak, you walk through the stuff and you don't get the rash for a day or two. Now, a couple of interesting things about that rash. The first thing that's interesting about that rash is the delay is the first thing that's interesting. The second thing that's interesting is that you have to basically, that's a memory response. And so you have to be exposed to poison oak at least once where you don't get it, where your immune system learns that poison oak is dangerous. So a lot of people say, I don't get poison oak. And it's possible that the next time they get exposed to it, they may get it. So for instance, I've never gotten really a poison oak rash. I go out in the woods all the time, but it's because I avoid it. And my brother gets it. So I'm pretty sure that I'm not genetically immune to getting poison oak. So I think it's more because I've gone out of my way to avoid it or to wash it off afterwards. The other thing that's really interesting about poison oak is that it's not really a poison. We're overreacting to a molecule, these oils called erushiol, that really aren't dangerous. And our immune system perceives them as dangerous and mounts this gigantic response. And so all the rash and all the itching and all the cell death occurs because we're making this aberrant response against this molecule. And other animals, goats and dogs, can run through the poison oak and they don't get that response. So it's pretty much, in this case, that type of response is found in other animals, but there, that specific response to poison oak is pretty much found in humans. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is that that oil is found in a bunch of things. So it's found in poison oak and it's found in poison ivy and poison sumac, but a similar sort of molecule is also found in things like mangoes. And so that's one reason why a lot of people are allergic to mangoes, but not everybody. So Very interesting. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard people tell me, oh, I'm immune to poison oak. And I think of this, what you just described when they say that. It's like, the next time might be different. Oh, no. So I grew up in Florida and we often hear people say, I never get sunburned. And then they'll come back and they'll be really regret that they said that because they <laughs> hadn't been out in the Florida sun before, basically. As we talked about at the very beginning today, this audience, it's a lot of people really interested in nature from a different perspective. It's people who go out and they do look in the woods for fungi and bugs and birds and plants and you name it. So I imagine that that little tidbit will be very helpful to them. And I think also it's maybe worth a transition to talk about your naturalist interests. One of the first things that I learned about you is that you've been on a, a venture to photograph every order of birds in the world. So can you tell me about that? Where are you at? What's missing? What's been the hardest one? There's a lot of probably fun stories built into that. Okay. So I don't know where I came up with this. I like taking pictures of nature. I actually teach classes at Stanford called Photographing Nature. They're very popular. I'll just divert for a second and talk a little bit about the class. The class has basically four pillars. One is look around you, notice a tree, notice something in nature. So we're the most oblivious generation in history, not only in, in the most oblivious place. So most people go through the day, they'll know exactly what's on their phone, but they'll have no idea what plant or animal goes by. So observe. The second thing is learn. So you can observe, but then you have to go and figure out what's there. Now we have some really amazing tools like iNaturalist, where you can take a picture of a plant or a bird and you can post it and you can either instantly using an AI program or using a community who can look at your pictures, figure out what it is that you took a picture of. So it's just remarkable which how much that's facilitated our ability to learn about different things in our environment. The third part is communicate. So how do we communicate using pictures? And it's interesting that we learn how to communicate with words and with math. We can be literate, we can be illiterate, we can be numerate, innumerate. We don't even have a vocabulary for thinking about how to communicate with pictures. So there is no picture it, picture it. We have to use words to talk about our ability to communicate with pictures. We have to use literary words like visual literacy or something like that. So the third thing is, how do we communicate with pictures? Which we're doing more and more, but most people don't know what they're doing. They're just, they may be doing it effectively. They may not be doing it effectively. And the fourth part of this is learning something about your camera. And there's a subset now is because everybody's now who's using a camera is now using technology to modify their pictures. Even if you're using your phone and you're not trying to, you're still using technology to modify your picture. So how can we learn about how to most effectively use some of that technology? So we learned a little bit about taking pictures and post-processing. So I've been really interested in nature photography for a while. I think it just enhances our world. 
And so I realized that some of the most interesting things to take pictures of are birds. They tempt you, they get close, they're colorful, they sometimes they're challenging. Sometimes they'll talk to you, you know, they'll make noise. So you'll say, oh, come take my picture or something like that. So it's been really fun and challenging taking pictures of birds. And so I realized, oh, I have a whole lot of bird pictures. And I'm, I've always been interested in taxonomy. I've written a, a textbook chapter on the taxonomy of viruses, okay, which we were talking about earlier. So I decided for species are less interesting. One sparrow looks a lot like another sparrow. But if you think about orders of birds, those are things we can wrap our heads around. For instance, Penguins are an order of birds, okay? Little kids can tell you, oh, that's a penguin. Or owls are an order of birds. Again, almost anybody can tell you that's an owl. Or all the perching birds basically fit in the same order. So we can think about things like that. So some order, some orders are less intuitive, but many of the orders are intuitive. So what if we could take a picture of every order of birds in the world? Now, first of all, we have to ask how many are there, okay? And the answer is it depends on who you ask. So one of the most interesting orders is the order that includes hummingbirds. And so hummingbirds have these sharp little beaks. And by some people, it's in the same order as these birds called frog mouths or who have these giant beaks and look nothing like hummingbirds at all. But genetically, they have some similarities. So other people put those in separate orders. So I decided I would make it as hard for myself as possible. So I would have the maximum number of orders I could find. And that's about 44 orders of birds. And so really, it's a thinly veiled excuse for traveling around the world to interesting places and looking for all kinds of creatures, but mm -hmm. birds also. And so I've now gotten to the point where I've essentially gotten 43 of the 44. And that means that it had to take me to some wild places. Now, it turns out two orders are only found in Madagascar. And by chance, I had already photographed those two orders. So although I've been to Madagascar three times, I don't have to go back now that I'm on my bird quest to go take those. But I would like to go back some of those. And they, these tend to be orders that nobody's ever heard of before, like mesites or coup rollers, because you have to go to Madagascar to see them. So the end game tends to be interesting. You have to go to interesting places. So I recently got back from New Caledonia, where there's a really interesting order that involves a bird called the kagu. And so it turns out kagus are not that hard to find. They're not that hard to photograph, except you have to go to New Caledonia to do it. And now the one order that's left is, a, is an order called the Watson, H-O-A-T-Z-I-N. And they're found in Northern South America. And again, as I understand, they're not that hard to find, but you got to go to where they are. But they're really interesting birds. There was a, an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago about Watsons and how strange these birds are. So it's been great. And some of the, these birds are, like, for instance, the Kago is about the size of a chicken. It's a big bird. It's a really interesting bird in all kinds of ways. It's flightless. So that's one reason why it's not that hard to take pictures of. And really, the hardest order, I think, is probably the kiwi. So the kiwi, there are five species of kiwis. They're only found in New Zealand. They are nocturnal, and they're shy, and you're not allowed to use flash. So one of the things I did was I actually got an infrared camera. And so it allows you to take pictures in the dark. And so that was a fun thing to do. I really need to go back and get better pictures. There are a few places where you can get pictures in the daytime of Kiwis. One of the things I did, since I make up the rules, I can decide if this is cheating or not. But one of the things I did was I went to a place where they breed Kiwis and took pictures of Kiwi Kiwis, you know, as they're monitoring the eggs and stuff. So that's fun. So I have some pretty good pictures of Kiwis, but they're in captivity. So that doesn't quite count. So I might need to make another trip back to New Zealand again. You do have the wild kiwis with infrared. There again, it's I, it's slightly cheating. It's in a reserve, so it's in, a, in order to really. You know, I see. You're coming clean. I could trick people, but yeah. So. <laughs> but but then hopefully the next trip will be to the place in Ecuador where it's pretty straightforward to see the Watson bird. It's also the national bird of I think I, I know, It's their bald eagle, I guess. So that would be fun. And there's some really cool, you have to go into the rainforest, which is cool. Yeah. Birding is a good excuse for lots of things. It's an excuse to go hiking. It's an excuse to go to exotic places. It's an excuse to refine your photography, buy new photographic gear. I'm hearing all of this coming out as you tell me the story. Well, it's fun because you invited me to, I went on my first Christmas bird count with you. And the first day we went out, this was a couple of years ago. It was absolutely pouring rain. And so it was an epic hike. 
it was hard to keep your cameras dry and everything like that, but the sun would come out intermittently and the light was really beautiful and the water was incredible. It was kind of an amazing experience. So part of it, part of the cool thing is getting in the game. So one thing, if you don't get outside and get in the game, you're not going to get the pictures. Uh, but I will say that you're sort of a birder and I'm a, I am protest being a birder. I think birders are people who carry around binoculars. Birders are people who get up really early in the morning. Birders are people who have an e-bird account. Birders are people who don't care whether they photograph it or not so they can see a, a band-tail pigeon, you know, in the sky and they can say, oh, I count that. They also care about how many they count. So photographers, if I got one really great picture of a band-tail pigeon, I wouldn't care if there were 10,000 there because I got my really great picture, but bird, birds care. <laughs> uh, so birds care about how many species they see. So I'm more at a high level of orders rather than species. So most people would call me a birder, but I'm a, a birder denialist. With that spectrum that you just laid out, it's like a slider switch for me. I kind of go back and forth between the two. It depends on the year. I will talk about one thing that I think is of as pitiful. That's a funny anecdote. So the first time I went to the Galapagos, and I knew a lot about evolution and everything like that, I went to the Galapagos. I was, this was in the 1990s, and I'm coming back, and I have this memory of this. There's only one island where there's albatross. And so we were on this island, and the albatross flew across my head. And I remember hearing it go across my head, and the sound it was very quiet, and the sound was like of its wings going, as it flapped, was a revelation to me. And I thought, if I had paid this much attention in my home, what could I see? So I went back and I became really interested in sort of looking around where you live, where your yard and, and finding nature close to home. Now, it's interesting because I've been back to the Galapagos a whole bunch of times and I've been various other places where there's albatross and I've come to the conclusion that event never happened. And the reason for that is albatross rarely flap their wings. I don't know how I came to this vivid memory of this albatross flapping its wings. Albatross can go for a long period of time, never flapping their wings. And in the Galapagos, the albatross actually jump off a cliff and catch the wind. And then when they land, they like crash down. And I've gone back there. I've never really seen an albatross flapping its wings. So mm. I don't, I don't actually think that actually happened, but it was life changing. Maybe it was a very large gall that you saw. <laughs> exactly. You know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. <laughs> and to your point. I think we often overlook common things too, such as a common raven. And when you mentioned hearing the wings of this bird, which is apparently not an albatross, every time a raven flies by, you can hear those wings. You can hear the air moving. And I am always just left awestruck by that. Actually, let me just comment on a little bit. So one of my favorite sounds is the morning doves, which sounds like when they fly, they sound like a little mechanical device that's not very well maintained. So you want to grab them and give them a little bit of oil so they're not <laughs> squeaky. Before I forget to go back, you mentioned viral zone. Do you have any other references or services or books or whatever the case might be that the people who are interested in learning more about any of the topics we talked about today, where they could go? So you prepped me ahead of time about asking about this question. So I don't have any books and things like that sort of were my inspiration. So often when you talk about infectious disease, people will talk about a couple books. One is this thing called The Microbe Hunters. And a lot of the people of the generation before me read this book that was written 100 years ago as their inspiration. Other people will talk about The Hot Zone as being their inspiration. So I don't think there's any specific book, but there's a lot of really great trade books about viruses. There's a lot of good, and I have a whole shelf full of books about polio and a whole shelf full of books about vaccines. And so a lot of those are really accessible, maybe more accessible than my talk today, stories about viruses. And even there's now like a whole shelf full of books about coronavirus. And some of those are really good. A few of them are really bad, but there's some that are really good. So I encourage people to check out some of these trade books about viruses. You know, again, the, the hot zone would be fine. There's a book called Demon in the Freezer which is about the smallpox effort to eradicate smallpox. There's a guy named David Quammen. He's written a book about Ebola. He's written a book about a coronavirus called Breathless. And so there's a bunch of really great books. I also thought about this because I recently finished another book that really has nothing to do with viruses, but I think it's a book I would recommend in terms of your audience if they haven't encountered An Immense World by Ed Young. 
it's great because it changes. It's a book that changes your perspective. So it gets you out. Hopefully it gets you out of your very human view of the world and realizing that that you're the strange one and animals are seeing the world very differently. And one really great example of that is, is if you go out with a fluorescent light, you can see creatures like, for instance, in my backyard, there's a fluorescent millipede. And when you put a fluorescent light on it, it just the, they, they just light up. They're all over the place. Or there's lichens or fungi that are fluorescent. And I learned that some reptiles are fluorescent. There's even some mammals that are fluorescent. And so you write, what are they doing with this fluorescence? And the answer is, it's a normal thing. It's just their color. It's just that we happen to be blind to anything that's beyond purple. And so the fact is that's the normal world, but we're just completely blind to things that are only, we only see things that are in our own wavelength range or in our own sound range or in our own smell range or our own hearing range. And so that's really interesting. Or again, when you look at an animal and they look you straight in the eyes, if it's a bird, they're probably not seeing what, because their birds are often, their eyes are often on the side. And so they're seeing a very different you than you're seeing of them. So Again, I love the Ed Young book is in terms of that. There's also a lot of great books about evolution. I guess everybody should try to delve a little bit into into Darwin mm-hmm. and things like that. If not The Origin of Species, then Voyage of the Beagle, which is somewhat more accessible. So a lot of great books out there. And so as far as resources, I guess there's some great textbooks of virology, but, but I'd probably go to the trade books and I'd go to for data, for information. You, know, you might try Viral Zone. There's also stuff on the CDC side and there's stuff on Wikipedia. So I think that's good for looking stuff up. All right. So if you could magically impart one ecological or maybe biological concept to help the general public see the world as you see it, what might that be? For me, what I'm really trying to convey to people is to go out there, explore and immerse yourself, appreciate and preserve. I think that the main thing that causes people to preserve the environment is being able to get out there and see what's there. And so I think that I'd really love to see people get involved. There's so many free walks and stuff on campus. A lot of entertainment is very expensive, but the community that's out there is just so interesting. And the biology, I mean, there's, yeah, I can't think of anything more interesting than the diversity of microorganisms. And for instance, some friends, well, they'll introduce you to something like slime molds, which are probably not on your radar screen. And then suddenly you'll start seeing slime molds or mushrooms and they're beautiful and amazing and or types of insects or birds or whatever. So it just increases your sort of appreciation for the world. It's just, it's such a life enhancing thing. And that'll also get people to be more engaged in things like conservation. So I'd tell people to get out there. The other thing I would tell people as an educator is don't buy into this sort of narrative that we're too stupid to understand If it's complicated, maybe you just need to take a little bit more time to immerse yourself in the subtleties. And it's the nuances and things like that are often the most interesting and important parts of of the natural world. Totally agree. So do you have any any projects or upcoming presentations or webinars or anything that you'd like to highlight? So most of my projects are involved teaching things at Stanford. I do. There's some classes I have that are taught through the continuing studies department that are open to the public. And I have a bunch of projects like the bird project. There's no particular book or project and stuff that I'm necessarily like pushing right now. I do have a column in a local magazine called Punch Magazine. It's called Our Wild Side. And it's basically a way to show a lot of my nature photographs. And that's been super fun. Well, great. And I guess maybe a related question then to wrap up is if people want to follow you or your work, where can they go? Are you on social media? Maybe on iNaturalist? Oh, so I'm definitely on iNaturalist. You can follow me there. One thing about iNaturalist is that you can gamify it. And so I'm competing with myself in terms of the thing that I think is interesting is not how many different observations you can post. Each time you, you see something, you can post an observation, but how many different species that are there. And so that actually, it's not so much that I want to see every single bird, but it gives you a window into the incredible diversity and beauty of nature. And for me, that often involves taking a, a fun picture, something that's interesting. I also have a, a website where it has some of my travels and things like that on there. And that's through the Stanford website. So basically you can search on my name and, and find my Stanford website. 
I also think I would recommend just because affiliated with the university, I would recommend going to the Stanford site. There's a lot of like public talks and things like that, that you can go to. They may not be by me, but they're super interesting. So the other place you can see some of the, some stuff from me is, so I have a number of venues where I put medium format articles. So both on medium, I also have some op-eds that ironically enough are on Fox News site. I think it's interesting to go back and see what you thought about the pandemic or about various things in different parts of time, different points of time. I got some things really wrong. Like I didn't realize that the U.S. would screw up so badly in terms of their pandemic response, but but I'm pretty pleased with the stuff that I put out there. And I think it's still, most of it still holds up. I have a fun, <laughs> not many people have looked at it, but I have a fun medium post called Message in a Bottle. And it's a, sort of a riff on the, the song by the police, but it talks about mRNA vaccines. Amusing, talking about how prescient they were in that song to predict mRNA vaccines. So there's various places. Also, I get I have a number of interviews in the in the media, so they show up randomly. Bob, thank you again for this wonderful discussion. We covered a lot of ground. I know there's a lot more that could be covered, and I'll try to make sure in the show notes to to link to some of those additional resources, so the people that, who are curious can go find those and continue their own journey. So thank you again. I appreciate your time and you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Of course, as you probably can tell, I will jump at every opportunity to discuss viruses and discuss nature and photography. So this has been a great experience for me. So thank you so much. Before wrapping up, thank you to Michelle Balderston for editing help this week. Thank you to the Patreon patrons for your continued support and everyone who has left ratings and reviews of the podcast. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support, so check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.